Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing very well, Maya. Thanks very much for asking. Well, I'm very happy to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. And uh, I think a lot of people will be very happy to see you as well and to hear from you as we were all of a sudden uh, cut from you, <laughs> Mr. Struthers. Uh, so I would like to start by maybe addressing the issue that a lot of people may be wondering about, and it is uh, your health, uh, because uh, as we know, because of uh, your health, you had to stop doing many things that you were doing uh, last year, which was being president of the Criminal Lawyers Association. You're also, you're a prominent criminal defense lawyer, but all of that had to stop. Pretty much everything you were doing in your life other than that uh, was put on hold because of your health. So maybe if you can just tell us what happened, give us an update. How are things now? Well, the good news is I think I'm doing much better. My energy is returning and uh, I am uh, in much better shape. Um, they don't really tell you what you're going to go through. I don't think they want to make you that unhappy. Um, July 6th of last year, I was diagnosed with uh, throat cancer and tongue cancer at the very base of my tongue and my throat. I'd been to a couple of dentists. Uh, I had had a tooth problem and I thought the discomfort I was having might have been related to that and uh, was working on my teeth at that point, which are fine. But I was misled into thinking that had something uh, was the problem. And so it, it uh, went a little too far and uh, the dentist missed it. Eventually, I had a swollen lymph node, which got me to the hospital and uh, they, uh, through a series of tests, diagnosed the problem. And one of the reasons you haven't seen me is because I was diagnosed uh, up here in Perry Sound, uh, which is halfway between Toronto and Sudbury. And we're a catchment area for the cancer center in Sudbury. So I, uh, as a result of some difficulties getting started at Princess Margaret in Toronto, I ended up going to Sudbury for three months and staying at Airbnbs up there while I was getting my treatment. And they fry you. They give you 35 radiation treatments, uh, five a day, uh, five a week, I'm sorry, one a day. And once a week, you get a massive dose of chemotherapy as well. So Fridays weren't good days. But uh, at the end of the, the process, um, I'm all right. Um, still having some difficulty eating, uh, but that's okay. And uh, I tell people that I don't mind the weight loss very much, but I don't recommend the spa. It's not the best place to go to lose weight. But uh, I'm fine, and uh, you know, as fine as any of us are, and I think it serves maybe to remind me, certainly, and maybe others as well, that you just never know. You know, the clock is ticking, and you had best to understand that uh, there are very important things, uh, more important things than uh, what we do for a living. So I had to concentrate that on that entirely, and of course I did, and uh, everyone in my office was absolutely terrific. Maya Martin and Dennis Sarakaya, Mike Jusky took up a lot of my work, and uh, saw a lot of it to completion and uh, did a great job of course probably better than me the clients did all right and uh so a year later i'm now as you probably all already know my uh, we've been friends for quite some time i take most of my summers off uh, i have you know just in terms of work-life balance and i'm a very much a cottage person so I, I when i say my summer's off summer in canada is one of the shortest things ever as you know it doesn't <laughs> doesn't last very long much to your chagrin as a person who likes the heat but um so i i take all of my time off pretty much in the in the summertime and of course the juries really aren't sitting and if they are they're miserable so that's not really a great time to have a jury trial and uh everything it seems very strange doesn't it but the the season seems to start in september just like the school season starts you know uh, everybody goes back and does a whole round of cases september to christmas and then christmas to the summertime and I guess it has something to do with kids in school and, you know, juries needing to have uh, access to their kids on vacation. They can't really be cooped up in the jury room. They'll go nuts. So I, it's uh, September's coming uh, soon enough, and I will get back at that point to seeing which cases I choose uh, to do. In the meantime, I'm doing a lot of consulting work. I'm talking, of course, we have 13 members in our chambers and we're on a WhatsApp group and other groups as well. And so I get questions every day about strategy, which is the one, th one of the two things I'm good at, Maya. I'm good at cross-examining and I'm good at strategy. And uh, so I get a lot of questions about strategic approaches to things and whether I should bring this motion or that, you know, what the target is and how you get the, through the pylons to get to the, uh, the goal at the end of the road. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. 
All right. So first of all, we're very happy to hear that you're uh, feeling much better, your energy is better, and that you're slowly starting to go back to work. And it seems like in the fall, that's when you're going to be going back into practice. Yes, I, I, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be the frenetic pace that it once was, you know, where I'm going to six courthouses a day and, you know, two jails in the evening. That's not going to happen anymore. I can assure you of that, but I will stay involved and I'll certainly be doing some cases going forward. Well, and I think we're all going to be very happy to see that you're back in the race, uh, John. Uh, but okay, um, but before this happened, you were actually, and like you were saying before, you were very busy. You were doing quite a lot of work, not just as a criminal defense lawyer. And as a criminal defense lawyer, you were obviously doing a lot of very serious cases, murder cases and other types of uh, uh, serious crimes. But you were also the uh, president of the Criminal Lawyers Association at the time, and even that had to come to an end. You had to step down because of uh, your health. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what you did as criminal, uh, as president of the Criminal Lawyers Association, because you were president actually at a very unique time. <laughs> it's at let's hope so. Let's hope so. Let's hope it's unique. Let's hope it is unique. But that you were president when the pandemic hit, and um, it was just a very scary and unprecedented time for for us all. We had no idea what to do. Zoom didn't even Zoom court didn't exist back then. We only had videos sometimes for some witnesses who were not in town. Right. But it wasn't just like what we're doing right now, where remands have become virtual. So that all happened during the pandemic and under your uh, your presidency. And you helped, you know, do this uh, transition. Like you were the one who helped us transition into uh, the um, uh, uh, virtual court. So tell us a bit more about that, because it was a hectic time. It's a mild understatement. I don't think I've ever been inten that intensely busy in my life. I mean, you know, law school exams pale by comparison. Um, I got into uh, the CLA, uh, of course, uh, to do some good for the profession, theoretically. And particularly, I wanted to become president because I think we really needed to do the legal aid fight, and we still do. And uh, there may be developments in that score, let's hope. Uh, things are very sensitive at the moment, so I really don't want to get uh how shall we say uh political at this point about that but when the uh when i was elected in november of course uh that's sort of when our annual meeting is we have christmas and then you know we get started in january pretty much like everybody else and we were doing all sorts of really good things and it was a great board really excellent people and then March the 13th i guess was when everything shut down when the nba and everything else uh, first came to the conclusion that they were going to close down and all hell broke loose it was pretty interesting and i mean i can remember sitting in the lawyer's lounge in the change room on a bench at 361 on a conference call with the chief justices the associate chief justice like it was like an insane phone call about what they were going to do and uh you know i just made it very clear as was reported in the paper that we had to take a pause, figure out what we were dealing with, and make sure that everybody was safe. The court reporters, the clerks, the court staff, and the lawyers and the Crown attorneys had to be safe. We didn't know what we were dealing with. Our friend Sandy C., who was a federal Crown at the time, had previously been a provincial Crown for many years, my vintage. In fact, we, we were called at the same time and went to uh, all the Crown camps together. I was a Crown attorney when I started out very tragically passed away from COVID early on in the proceedings. And, you know, we didn't know what we had. And so I just made it very clear to the chief justices and to everybody who would listen to us that it was time to press pause and to stop what we were doing and figure out what measures we needed to take to protect people's health and safety. And I mean, erroneously, they determined that plexiglass was going to be helpful when it's an airborne uh, virus it really didn't matter terribly much about the plexiglass people made a lot of mistakes you know we didn't mask immediately uh, that was a mistake and so there was a, a lot to be done but one of the things that happened was there was a group of individuals that had already been meeting regularly called the criminal modernization committee 
This was something convened by Justice uh, Lise Mazin of early before the pandemic started in, a, in an effort to try and modernize our system, an effort to get these sorts of things going that would make things more efficient and to try and make the system work better. So it was a major panel that she had convened and it was already go ongoing. And Boris Patinsky and I had been attending for the CLA. And this included the chiefs of police of some regions, the president of legal aid and the, his deputies, the deputy solicitor general who's in charge of running the courts, if you will, the staffing of the courts and her assistants. It was Deborah Richardson at that point. The deputy attorney general and the attorney general at some meetings the Chief Justice and the Associate Chief Justices of the Provincial Court, Crown Attorneys, of course, MAG personnel, and basically the entire system was represented at the highest levels at this organizational criminal modernization meeting. And we got together and said, well, what the hell are we going to do? And they had a system in place working uh, at for internally at the Ministry of the Attorney General, and I guess some of the courts, as you point out, like the Supreme Court as well, where you can appear remotely by video even prior to the pandemic. Um, they had a system in place called Teams, I guess, uh, or something like it internally. There was another one in, as well that they had working, and it was just awful. It was laggy. It was brutal. It was terrible. The, the, whatever the system was, was terrible. And this is what they were trying to use. And we went nuts on them and said, this is never going to work. Uh, we needed a system where a client with rudimentary skills, perhaps no skills, could push a button on a cell phone and get to court. Like it had to be that simple because if you're starting to join teams and you're joining this team and you're, you know, it's too complicated for people who didn't, hadn't used it before. Witnesses, elderly people like me. So it was a, it was a real struggle to get them to come around to Zoom because, of course, it cost money to do that because they had to buy licenses and they had to get it organized. And, of course, the clerks didn't know what to do and they were in deep trouble because they didn't want to go in. And when they did go in, they wanted to be protected. The judges, of course, wanted everyone in court. Of course, the judges have a private parking lot and a private entrance and a private elevator and a private bathroom and a private office and they get their books carried to court and they sit on this, you know, they didn't have a problem with it. But we had to protect everybody, and I think we did a pretty good job of it. And I think we can say safely now, with the tragic exception of Sandy before we started, we didn't lose anybody. We didn't lose anybody in the courts, the staff, the reporters, the clerks, the judges, the crowds, and the defense lawyers. I may be wrong, and of course, uh, people may not have spoken about it, but I don't think we lost anybody, at least not to my knowledge. And I take great pride in that. I also take great pride in the fact that our system survived, that it worked through an enormous difficulty. I remember at the beginning, people were saying, well, you know, one example, mass remands. People aren't coming to court. How are we ever going to do that? That's not legal. You know, I mean, you know, we're going to lose jurisdiction. Everybody, we're going to have to subpoena, for, I'm sorry, summons 500 people, uh, you know, a day that didn't come to 407 court. And I pointed it out then, and I point out now about other topics. This is all made up. The entire thing is made up from the beginning to the end. Our legal system, our relations, all of it is made up. It's a complete construct. And because it's made up, you can change it. If you couldn't remand 500 people a day in a, in a bulk remand last week, well, change the rules. Whatever you got to do to make it work, you can make it work. You know, this is made up. So we are in a new paradigm. We have a new problem. We're in a whole, we're underwater now. You can't breathe through your mouth anymore. You better have some scuba gear. And so we changed things dramatically. And you know so many things, the bail protocols, how we approach bails. And the amount of work that people did uh, is just astonishing to me at that time. I can remember sitting there initially, our main problem was that we had nearly seven to 7,800, I think, people in jail in Ontario when we started. And we, you know, criminal defense lawyers, now most of them don't belong there. It's ridiculous. You know, there are some that are violent, nasty people that are going to repeat. There's no question they belong in jail. But the number of people in jail was overblown, excessive, as it is now. And I can remember Sid Freeman sitting in her office all night long with spreadsheets, booking volunteers, booking volunteers to go into the uh, courts and to the jails to interview literally every single person we had to see if they had counsel, to see if they were prepared to do a bail review, to see if we can renegotiate with the Crown, to do whatever we had to do to get people out of jail. And we got the jails down to under 6,000 people. 
And we know that that saved lives because they were able to isolate people who were sick and to put people, you know, and they had ranges now that were open that they could use as infirmaries and they could do a better job of it. And the world didn't fall apart. There wasn't chaos in the streets. In fact, crime went down over COVID because people weren't going out. So it was, uh, it was really uh, beneficial. And, you know, Dan Brown putting on a red tie as a fake sash to do a, a demonstration of a Zoom trial where Lisa Jorgensen was the witness. And we did an entire panel and we recorded it. And it ended up in BC and Alberta as, as the model for how you're going to do Zoom trials on, on online. The CLA really took a lead. And I think one of the really, really beneficial parts of, and let's be positive, of the COVID pandemic is that the defense bar stood up. It would have fallen apart with us. They didn't know what to do. They were in a state of complete disarray. And we said, one, you got to have communications. And we, we went through what we needed to do and we made it happen. If it wasn't for us, the system would have collapsed. I'm, I'm convinced of it. And we should be very, very proud of what we did. And of course, at every meeting, Boris and I are sitting there for hours. At every evening, everybody's putting things together, trying to get the system back working again. Everybody's volunteering and going into the jails and into the courts uh, to try and get these people out of jail and, and save lives. And throughout the entire pandemic, the only people that were working for free to do that were the defense lawyers. Yes, we're, we're at a, we're at a meeting and everybody's meters running the chief justice from down to the, you know, president of legal aid, everybody's meters running at the table for six, 60 people. Pandemic defense lawyers are still doing a lot of work for free. I mean, that's <laughs> what we well, I, we, we can get into that much of what was, you know, given to us uh, remains with us. And of course, people, you know, this from being in an office or anything else, the people that do the work, get the work. That's how it goes. You know, if you're prepared to work very hard, you're going to get more work because people trust you to do the work. You know, people that don't want to do the work don't get the work. So the criminal defense took on a lot and we're still taking on a lot and we're still doing it for free. You know, you know, we decided to go electronic, right? We're going to have, you know, everything filed electronically, served electronically. We're going to save paper and trees and we're going to have it all organized. And then we go to court everything's filed under case lines or whatever your system might be on the day. And the judge says, well, I want it printed. Really? Well, you have an office and a secretary and a printer. Go print it. Why is it for us to do their job for them? I mean, this is it, it's gotten to the point of absurdity. They want us to invest in new materials and Zoom licenses and, you know, learn how to do case lines, but they don't want to do it themselves. So with the greatest of respect, we have got to ensure that the advances that we made over COVID that had benefit us are maintained and strengthened and expanded. And, you know, there's nothing, you know, a lot of, I faced a lot of criticism from a lot of fronts about Zoom. Zoom's no good. You know, you can't cross-examine. People are cheating. You know, somebody's giving them tips from off screen. Very rare to say the least. Reed Rasonic and I did the first major Zoom trial that last weeks in front of Justice Kelly on a bunch of gun importations. In Toronto, and it was brilliant. Had no problem with it at all. I find it much easier to cross examine in some ways because you can call up documents and everybody's looking at the same thing very easily. And when I'm looking at somebody on a screen, it's like I pulled my chair up four feet in front of the jury box. I'm sorry, in front of the witness box. I'm staring in somebody's eyes. I can see their eyes dilating. I can hear their, their breathing in my ears. You know, it's like an intimacy that you don't get in court across the way. In Superior Court in Toronto, you can't even see the witness from the defense tables. If you're sitting down in front of the court in Toronto and the judge is up here and the, and the witness is over to your right, you can't see the witness in your chair. You have to stand up or get out somewhere yeah. else to see them. You can't, you can't even see them. I'm not even as tall as you are. Yeah. What was my problem? When I'm in court? That's right. But I mean, it, it's, it's absurd. And, you know, I speak to judges uh, all the time and many of them said to me, look, I'm sitting on a perch and the witness is down there below me to my left and he's facing out towards the crown attorney i'm not looking at his face i'm looking at the his right ear most of the time yeah. and i'm trying to write as well so i can't be looking at him and you know typing or, or many type now so i'm distracted and if he turns to, to me and the witness that is turns to me to speak then i see his face but you know regional senior justice said to me you know i get a better experience 
looking at someone in the face directly. And, uh, you know, it's not rude to stare at somebody on a, on a computer the way it would be in court. There's a lot of things. But I agree. The pomp and circumstance, the seriousness, the uh, accoutrement, the trappings of the court system, all of that are beneficial and they're required in many cases. And uh, I love being in court. But we just couldn't do it at the time. Certainly, we didn't have the volume to do it. We couldn't have done you know, all the cases that everybody wanted to do in person. In person, it was just not possible. So this was the best available alternative, and it worked really, really well. Now, I, I think that going forward, you know, we need to maintain for JPTs for many things, including some witnesses. And Zoom, is bro Zoom is brilliant. You know, I don't want to drive to Newmark to sit in the corridor for an hour and a half to wait for my 10-minute JPT meeting in somebody else's office. You know, once again, it's the defense lawyers that are, you know, can you, I said this before, you know, crown pretrials in person. Can you imagine if the crown attorney had to come to your office and sit in your waiting room for an hour to talk to you about your case? They would not put up with it. Not a chance, but we're expected to do that. Even if it's by phone, it's still That's the right. lawyers who have to call the crown. Right. That's right. Offices. I know. So everything is devolved onto the defense lawyers, the costs, the expense, the travel, the time, all of it. And now you can't even get into the jails to see your clients. I mean, the roadblocks and the difficulties that are presented to the defense are just astronomical and unacceptable. And I don't think anything's going to change without a fight. You know, I've always been of the view that power isn't given up voluntarily. And, you know, they're not going to give you anything that you don't take from them. They're just not going to give it to you. So we did very well. And the people in the CLA, all of them, Adam Weisberg and the executive that I had as well, Dan Brown, Boris Patinsky, Lisa Jorgensen, all of them, Sid Freeman, just worked their tails off to make the system work. And they did it for free. And, you know, this is the the kind of community service and court support that maybe would deserve a King's Council. What do you think? As opposed to three days call to the bar in Ontario. But these people haven't been rewarded. They, you know, I'm not speaking about myself. I've been rewarded plenty. I mean, I yeah. will mention that you were actually rewarded by Wicked. And also, oh. recently... <laughs> Yes, I was, which was very nice of you. Yeah. Worth it. So, I mean, I think your efforts were recognized. Everybody appreciates all the hard work that you did. And I will also here give a shout out to Karen Stein, in Ottawa. I know who right. was so dealing. She was president of the DCAO and she did an exceptional job uh, as well at the time uh, managing the whole situation in Ottawa. So, I mean, I think what you did, John, was really uh, fantastic. And you allowed us all to start working sooner than we were even expecting. I don't think we ever- Well, we all need the money, you know? You can't just, defense lawyers just can't turn off the tap. Uh, you know, the expenses keep coming and they, you know, you're not yeah. getting loans. That's been helping as well, so. Mm, right. So, I mean, um, so just on that, I mean, that was really a very exceptional thing that you did during your uh, short term as president of the CLA. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, you you couldn't continue your full term, your second term. That was during the second term. Um, that That's right. I was there for uh, over two and a half years uh, as president. Yeah. But uh, the second term from November to July, I guess, was uh, so that's whatever. Yeah, about two and a half. So, I mean, you did an exceptional job as uh, president of the Criminal Lawyers Association, but you were also a uh, uh, one of the top uh, criminal defense lawyers in uh, Ontario. So maybe if you can tell us a bit more about your practice, we know you're going to be starting again slowly uh, in September. But before that, you were doing a lot of very serious crimes. I mean, you're um, in the same chambers, I think, as Sid Freeman, who's also... Yep a very senior criminal defense lawyer. So tell us a bit about your work before the pandemic. I was doing a lot of drug work uh, and a, a lot of homicides. Um, I think I had five on the go at the time I was forced to take a break. Uh, Sid does an enormous amount of them too. It's just one after another. It's amazing to me how she manages to do it. But I have a chambers in Toronto called Camden Law Law Chambers, which is on Spadina, 
right at Richmond Street, and it's a loft space with uh, big high ceilings and windows that open. Not big enough to jump, but they're they do open, and it shouldn't be open today with the air conditioning. But um, and a really great group of people. Rob McDonald is in there as well, and uh, Maya Martin, Sid Freeman, Lauren Sabse, Mike Jusky, Dennis Sarakaya, Elan Newman. Um, Alan Pierce from Edmonton shares our space as well. He's the Canada-wide drinking and driving lawyer. We have just a great group of people. We have a, four or five young new lawyers that are in there that are getting a great experience as well. And uh, we really have a lot of fun with it. And uh, it's right in a great part of town. You know, lunch is the best part of the day, as you know. So we are uh, we have a great variety of things that we can uh, go out and see and do in our neighborhood, which is terrific as well. So we have a lot of fun practicing law. And conveniently for us, the new Toronto courthouse is a walk away from our office. And so that worked out for us. We don't have to drive to Scarborough or North York anymore, though we still have to go to 2201 for bails, which is a, another crazy decision they made to put all of the bales in one inaccessible place in the middle of North Etobicoke. But uh, we do have a lot of fun. And, and it's stressful to say the least. Uh, we have high consequence cases, but we enjoy the work. We enjoy the law and we enjoy our, the camaraderie at the bar. And that's what I really miss. And I think that's what most of us miss over COVID. It's not getting hammered by some judge or, you know, hearing the bad verdict from the jury. We're not, we don't miss that necessarily, but we certainly miss our friends and our colleagues. And, you know, that time you spend in the corridor having coffee at the courthouse is invaluable as well with your colleagues because it's very difficult to keep keep the vibe going when you're not speaking or seeing anybody at all uh, and you're just on your one case doing your one thing on Zoom all the time if you're not going to court regularly. But uh, I miss my friends and I, I miss uh, the people of the CLA who were absolutely terrific. There's one other guy I should probably mention to you. Uh, we have an executive director at the CLA, a guy named John Chenyon. I know. <laughs> you know, and maybe our listeners don't, but he runs the CLA from an administrative point of view, and he was just brilliant. I mean, literally, the amount of work that he had to put in, thankfully, of course, he's, he's paid difficult lawyer personalities and oh yeah he has the toughest job and he's the That's nicest right. person in the CLA. He, yeah anyway he should get an awful lot of credit for how well the cla handle things and how well they do run because he really is the 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 rock of the cla in terms of keeping everything and everyone together including you i might point out so yeah <laughs> Like I have to say, I mean, that's also how I got to know you. It's through the work uh, that I was also doing uh, for the CLA. I mean, uh, I started yep. uh, working with the CLA when you were president. That's and right. To thank you for all the opportunities that you gave me because you were extremely supportive of everything and um, every idea that I had or things that I suggested. And I know that you weren't only supportive of me, you were just supportive with everyone. And you took the time to chat with all of us. So, I mean, I'm extremely grateful uh, for all the opportunities that you gave all of us. And it was really uh, a very fun time to work with you, John. And uh, you really did a lot for all of us uh, at the CLA and for the association, especially during COVID. But I wanna talk about one other thing that is not law related, but it's music. Okay. Because I know you love music, and actually, I think you were a musician, or you were into music even before you became a lawyer, right? Like your plans were not actually to become a lawyer; it was more music. Well, and people make plans, and God laughs, as they say, right? Far as well uh, behind you. So, uh, tell us a bit more about your love for music. I uh, started a band in high school, like many people did. You know, we all love the Beatles, and got interested in guitar very early and uh we had a bunch of bands in public school and junior high school and high school and the, the high school band that i had actually was pretty good they were called bear mother and we did very well and won four band contests in toronto that were put on by chum fm and others and so we were actually doing pretty well we had a recording contract and uh i was very young um 17 18 and I went to university. I went to York University. And of course, I studied music at York University. And uh, my first year was very 
difficult because I was playing in the band at night and going to university in the morning, very early in the morning, right? And Music 101 has this thing called sight singing, which basically they give you a book with written music in it, and you basically sing through the book for the intervals and the timing and everything else, and it's like a serious exercise. And they just go around the room and pick people and you just take over from the last guy and keep going. So I'm doing this at nine in the morning, like, you know, after I've been downtown playing in a band till two in the morning. So I went on the road with the band for seven years and we went all over the place and we had a lot of fun. And eventually the band became Red Rider, which uh, ended up with a, one of the members, Tom Cochran, who took the lead after I left. They did very well after I left, I'll point this out. And what happened was, uh, during one of the lulls in our uh, musical adventures, I went back to school. Things, you know, disco took over. You may remember disco. You may not. You may like disco. You may not. But it ended live music. What happened was, you know, at one time in downtown Toronto, you, there'd be 50 bands playing on a, on, a, on a weekend. Then everything, you know, they decided, well, it was cheaper to just play records. And disco came in. Yeah. And, and and so there was only 10 bands playing and 40 discos and then there were five bands playing and 45 and so things were slowing down significantly so i went back to school to music and i did two more years of music and our uh our uh music portables were outside we made so much noise that we were in these buildings that were separated you know like little schoolhouse portables outside of the university so we could make noises without bothering people and one of them was right outside the law school at Oscar. They put out one of these clapboards one day to uh, uh, LSATs, you know, two o'clock. So anyway, I, I took, I went and did that because when I was in the bands, we, we got stopped a lot. When I could grow hair, Maya, I did. I had hair twice as long as yours. And we got stopped all the time and searched by the cops a lot. You know, they were looking for the drugs and we didn't have any, so we never got in trouble. But at the end of the day, I didn't like that much. I didn't like the police going through my pants and my pockets. And, you know, one week we were playing downtown Toronto. We got stopped by the same two cops three nights in a row. Everything out of the car, you know, your guitars, your cases, you know, your strip searched. I didn't like it. Yeah. And so when I was back at university, I studied music, but I was in university, so I had other courses to take, and I had to take general arts courses, and I took philosophy of law and things like that, because I was interested in it. So anyway, long story short, I wrote the LSAT. I thought I was going back for my last year of music, and I wasn't, because I called the law school, and they hadn't received my documents, but I had them. And they told me, bring your documents up, uh, bring your copies up, we'll look at those. I took them up on Thursday, and he called me on Friday and said I could go to law school on Monday. I had no idea. I never met a lawyer. I never uh, didn't know about articling, didn't know about the bar ads. I didn't know anything. I said, I'll investigate, basically. I went for my first year and to see whether I would like it or not. And of course, I did. And so music continues. I play all the time. It's my major hobby, of course. And it's something like law, like criminal law. It's, it's one of those things where it's great fun, but it's not something you can make money at. Yeah. Right? Guitar is a great thing to do, but when you're, unless you're Keith Richards at my age, you're not going to be making money playing guitar, or you're, unless you're you know, really good like Sam Butsuvis, who has found a way to make a, a living playing in tribute bands. He plays in the band of tributes Elton Ron and one that tributes uh, Pink Floyd, and he's such a fine musician. But so, in any event, um, it's a great lifelong hobby, and it's something that you can do forever. And uh, hopefully, if your hands hold up, and uh, I just love it. and I poisoned my godson with it, and he won the Juno Award for Best New Band four years ago and is currently touring Europe. So uh, he's doing much better than I ever did when I was playing in terms of having fun with it. But it's a great hobby, and uh, you know, there's an awful lot of really good musicians in our business. You'd be surprised. Uh, Justice Russell Silverstein is a brilliant piano player, just fantastic. There's so many good musicians in our business, but as it's not a way to make a living, so people, of course took different paths in order to get a, get a job, you know? Well, thank you so much, John, for taking the time today to chat with us and to give us an update about how you're doing. It's very nice to see that you're doing much better now, and I'm very happy to hear that you will be going back to um, criminal defense 
uh, in the fall. It will be nice to see you back in action. And um, uh, you're still involved with the Criminal Lawyers Association. I know recently you attended one of the Legal Aid Committee meetings. So it's nice to see you slowly going back uh, into it. And uh, thank you for taking the time today to tell us about your um, your life, what you do, your interests, and uh, sure. hope we can have another follow-up interview soon and see how things are going. Absolutely. And I, I did want to say that, you know, the the criminal defense bar really is a family. I mean, we have, I've known so many people for so many years. And when I became ill, it was remarkable. The amount of uh, number of people that reached out to me and were very, very supportive. And I just wanted to be clear how grateful I am for that level of support that I got from everybody. And there's others that are going through stuff now too, that need that support and don't hesitate to reach out. It's very much appreciated. Um, and thank you for taking an interest in what I'm up to, Maya. I really appreciate it. Well, and we're grateful for all the work that you did for us, especially during the pandemic. That was really exceptional work. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm very happy that you're back, John. And it was very nice to chat with you today. Okay, Maya. Thanks so much.